Well, thank you very much um, for, to the organizers for inviting me and um, for accommodating my uh, change uh, of date. Um, so actually, so today um, I want to talk about stuff which actually I sort of looked at. I think the date on the paper was 1999. So this reminds, should remind uh, people of a great Prince song, um, 1999. But anyway, um, so it was some. It was a question that actually Bing Lee asked me, and um, um, about this work, and um, it's led to this um, new stuff, right? So basically, it's going back to this problem of, of shrinking targets um, for matrix transformations of the Tor, right? So <clears throat> let me see if I can get this to work. Yeah. Okay, so the general setup is that you have a, a D by D integer matrix. Um, so, um, it, so this is going to determine a, a map, self-map of the D-dimensional torus. And throughout MD is going to be uh, D-dimensional Lebesgue measure on the torus, okay? So straight away, I'm going to restrict my attention in this talk to a very special um, integer matrix, basically this matrix 2003, okay? Because I just there's no point in um, uh, doing anything more general at this moment, because there's not much <laughs> that we can do um, in higher dimensions anyway, okay? So, so what's the problem then? So, so if, um, so with T, um, an integer matrix uh, with non-zero determinant, then it preserves, uh, so it's measure preserving an ergodic with respect to two-dimensional Lebesgue measure on the torus. So in particularly what it means for us is that if you take a ball <coughs> or uh, with positive measure in the torus, then if you take any, if you take a point x in the torus, then the orbit under t, i.e. t to the n of x, will lie in this ball infinitely often. Okay, and this is a statement which is true uh, for almost all points x in the torus. Okay, so what you're thinking about here um, is, let me see if I can do this. So you've got your torus here, right? If you take some ball, which I'm gonna be, it's gonna be a square. You take some point X, well, so I need to get a bigger fat pen. Take some point X and you look at the action of X under T and what it's saying is that almost surely you will land inside this um, ball infinitely often. Okay, so in, in other words, trajectory of almost all points will hit the ball infinitely often. So in view of this, it's natural to ask, well, what happens if we allow the ball to shrink with time? Okay, so as, the, as n increases, what we want to do is let the ball decrease in time. So more precisely, um, <clears throat> what we're going to do is look at this uh, formulation here. Okay, so... Now, instead of the ball being fixed, so I'm gonna fix my ball right around the origin. And that's just for convenience. Um, and the ball with N, so as, as we look at, as, uh, as T acts on X, so we're looking at T to the N of X, then the ball is around the origin is gonna shrink at this rate where the rate is determined by this um, function Epsi. Okay, so we've got some decreasing function Epsi. Right, so the first thing to know, let's go through this bit reasonably quickly and then I'll rephrase the setup anyway, right, and, and then describe it a bit more. Um, so what it is, is this is, so it's a, it's a set of points which line infinitely many um, pre-images of this ball. Okay, so we can write it as the limb soup of um, the pre-images of the ball around the origin. Okay, so, so since T preserves the measure, what that means by definition is 
that the measure of the pre-image, so this t to the minus n of the ball, is equal to the ball that we started off with. Okay. So we're looking at here is a limb soup set. So now what we've got, we've already, so this tells us what the measure of this, um, of these building blocks of the limb soup set are. So, whoops, it's going in the wrong direction. So, sorry, I should just say here then. So what's the measure of this, uh, the pre-images, where is the measure of the ball that we started off with? And the measure, if, we, if I'm using the um, maximum norm, the measure four times um, exercise, what we should be thinking about here is that we've got the ball. So here's the torus. This ball is just, This uh, this is B zero of epsilon of n, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, can am I frozen? No, it's okay. Okay, so this this width here is epsilon of n. Right. So now we just apply the borel cantelli lemma, right? So if we apply the borel cantelli lemma, and if the sum of these measures, which is the four epsilon n squares, if these converge then the set of points which lie in infinitely many of these, i.e. this W to Epsi is zero, okay? So that's just the straightforward application of borel Contelli. So of course, um, we're gonna be interested then in what happens, so when the sum um, diverges, right? So we've just, come, we've just done a very simple proof of the convergence case here, so if it converges, then the measure is zero. So what actually happens is that if the sum diverges, so the sum of these um, epsi n squares diverges, then we've got full measure. Okay, so this is um, a statement which potentially I think goes back to, to the 90s. Okay, so <clears throat> if we now I want to look at this, um, the case where uh, things can't converge. So I want to take this um, special, just again, just to keep things um, explicit, right? So for any tour, I'm gonna look at the function, um, um, x goes to three to the minus x tour, okay? And for this function, I'm going to write, instead of w, t of epsi, I didn't even touch that. Uh, anyway, okay. So, so what we have with this fun, it's pretty clear that for any tor greater than zero, right? So we're looking at the sum of um, three to the minus um, n tor um, squared. Right, so this is going to converge. Right, so we're in the so we're in the convergence case when you tore positive. Right. Now this is this is zero measure for any tore positive. So we're not going to get any more information about the size of this set um, if we just, if we stuck if we stick with Lebesgue measure. So what we're going to do is use Hausdorff measure and uh, measure and dimension to measure its size. Okay, so I'm not gonna define measure, Hausdorff measure or dimension here. Um, it's just enough to, to note that um, um, when, I have, when I'm in the situation of Lebesgue measure zero, uh, there's a whole ar array of sets here of measure zero and I want to somehow distinguish between them. So I'm gonna use Hausdorff dimension. Okay, so it says then, that if tor is in this range between zero and one, then I have this expression tor. So the point is that as tor increases, so as the ball shrinks faster and faster, the size of the set decreases, right? Because this is a decreasing function in terms of tor. Okay, so, so this, is, this is the result from 1999 that um, Richard I proved. And um, that's, all I really want to say. Okay, so 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 we can we can say two things now, right? I mean, uh, so why am I telling you this? All right, uh, you may be wondering. 
Um, it seems like everything's known in terms of the size, the Lebanon house that I mentioned is known. Um, but what I want to do eventually is look at the situation in which um, the points on the torus are restricted to some curve. Okay, so this is going to take us into the world of sort of diaphantine approximate manifolds. But where is the diaphantine approximation here, right? So let's, let's, um, um, it's pretty straightforward, of course, right? That, um, so here's, so I just thank you to Evgeny Zorin for providing the pictures because I was completely lost how to do this. Um, so here's the, here's the torus, the unit square. And as I said, so this is the, this is going to be the, whoops, the, let me see, thick, it's medium, let's go for medium. So this is the origin. And so this is the ball around the origin, right? Okay, so of course, the measure of that ball is just, so this is of side length, um, whoops, epsi of n here. So the measure of this is four times epsi of n squared, right? That's what we used already before. Okay, so now, so this is this ball. So now we're gonna look at pre-images of this ball, right? So first of all, let's have a look at the pre-images of the origin, right? So for this, I've got some, I was gonna write it down, but then it was, I was really bad with the, the pen writing. So I, I, I just decided to type it. So we've got the matrix uh, 2003, then it's pretty easy to see that if I look at rationals, um, pairs where the X coordinate are rational to the denominator is two to the N and the Y are rational to the denominator three to the N. So I'm looking at two to the N, T over three to the N and I look at T to the N of this. So this will, so what does this do? Um, they're going for it's multiplying the x axis uh, points on the x coordinate by two and on the y coordinate by three, right? So then here, I'm just gonna end up with S origin, right, modulo z squared. So basically the, the, more, the point here is that the, um, the rational points of the so with two to the n, t over three to the n in the unit square are the pre-images of the origin, right? So let's just, let's just draw them. So here they are. Um, so here's the, so on the, along the x-axis, we're looking at rationals of denominator two to the n, y-axis um, denominates three to the n. And so what happened um, to this actual ball now? Well, going backwards um, in, in the horizontal direction, we're, we're shrinking by a half in the vertical direction, we're shrinking by um, th a third, right? So what we're gonna end up with is these um, rectangles. So this is um, centered around these rational points. And so here's a, this, this should be, so this one here is this rectangle here. Right, so the center here, whoops. Yep. Why won't it work? There you go. So the center is this point um, S over two to the N, uh, three over, oops, sorry, T over three to the N. Okay, and actually this this is, there's a mistake here. This There should be a two here as well, right? Because that's the side length. Okay. Right, so if I call this guy, um, so I'm going to call this rectangle, right, um, so it depends on n, the center, the, the, the numerator, and the side length is depend, depending on the function epsi, right? So let's, so and here is then the union of these angles to the points s over two to the n, t over three to the n. And um, so I'm gonna call this union, just this r n of epsi, right? So this is the union over all s and t um, 
where s is between zero and two to the n and t is from zero up to two to the n. Okay. Right. So, <clears throat> so this is just the summary of what I've just drawn. Right. So what we've got then is that the <clears throat> The set, the pre-image of the ball here is just the union over these rectangles and the side lengths of these rectangles, right, is, is given by this. But let me, let me just make one thing, sorry, I just wanted to make, uh, emphasize one thing. So look, so in the, in the horizontal direction, right, in this, along the x-axis, the separation, right, between the rationals is obviously one, uh, one over two to the n, right? In the vertical direction, the separation is one over three to the n. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> it's just something to keep in mind. Okay. So this means that we can write then our set, um, our shrinking target set, as a limb soup over these um, rectangles, right? And what is this? Well, this is nothing more than points x, y in the unit square or for which this, this holds here infinitely often, right? So in other words, this maximum is less than epsi q for infinitely many n, all right? So this is obviously now really a, a question or this, this set very much like a setup of um, a Diophantine approximation where, okay, you're not approximating by the same denominators, but you're approximating on one side with denominators of two to the n, the other by uh, three to the n, okay? Right, what's that mean? Okay. So, so I'm just here just recalling the, um, the results that we have. So this is why this is a kinching type theorem, right? Um, it's just, you know, if, if here we had Q, instead of two to the N and three to the N, we had Q, this would be a simultaneous form of a kinching theorem okay. in classical uh, Diophantine approximation. And here's the result for the W tor set, right? So I'm just uh, rewriting it now so we can see the, the result in terms of the shrinking target set, this set here, and the number theoretic set, this set here. Right, so, why can't I, sorry, I, I just keep, just trying to get rid of the, one second, sorry. It's also Psi of N, not Psi of Q. Where is it? Oh, second line. Oh, here. Yeah, here. Sorry, this is Epsi of N. Thank you. Okay, so I can't really see the bottom of my... <laughs> I, I have this toolbar which is coming up with the... Um, maybe I can just close it. Uh, someone's... Oh, I see someone's got a question. Oh, okay, thank you. Ah. So you get the thing bar coming up when someone asks a question. Okay, that's useful. Right, okay. So, so what's next, right? So, okay, so what's next is that we want to take the set that we've, that we've already studied and we know the size in terms of the dimension and the measure um, and we want to restrict the points of interest to lie on some curve. Okay, so we're in two dimensions here. So it's, in general, it would be a manifold, but here it's gonna be a curve. Okay, so what we wanna do is study this set of points, which are this um, epsi approximable, but restricted to the curve, right? So this is the set that we're gonna be interested in. Um, so what the aim would be is to, to, is to establish the, um, the, Le, the Lebesgue uh, statement and the Hausdorff dimension statement for this set of points restricted to the curve. 
Okay, so this is really very much in line with the classical theory of um, uh, diatomic approximation of manifolds. Um, and so one thing, so if we were looking at um, the Lebesgue theory, right, there's no point in looking at um, the two-dimensional Lebesgue measure, right, because the curve is of dimension one, right, so this measure of the curve intersect, whatever this set is, right, with, um, with any psi, is just going to be zero. Okay, so what we want to work with then is, of course, the measure on the curve. Right, so this is just induced um, one-dimensional Lebesgue measure. Okay, so to develop um, a Lebesgue theory for the curve intersect this set, we're going to work with the induced measure, uh, and I'm just going to write M for this. Okay. Oh, I've got another. Again, Q in place of N. Yes. Thank you, Evgeny. <laughs> yeah, the, this is going to be everywhere because I've just copied it, I guess, from uh, the previous slide. Okay, so, so I'm going to take a very simple case, okay, where the curve C is the diagonal line, right, Y equals X. And the point is that it's it is um, already um, interesting and seems to be quite difficult in, uh, to prove a full result anyway. So let me just take this a special case of the, um, the diagonal line. Okay, so what we prove is the following statement. So this is all as you would expect if you were um, if you're familiar with the um, the, the classical uh, diaphragm approximation manifold theory. Then what you find here is that. So remember, this is the the, the L is just the um, the diagonal, so it's one dimensional. So this is just one dimensional Lebesgue measure. This M, right? So what we find is that. The measure of this is zero or one, depending on whether the sum that we had before, i.e. the two-dimensional the, the two-dimensional volume sum, diverges or converges. Okay. So, and what we also have is that for the dimension. So remember, we're going to take this special just. This is just to bring things out explicitly, right? That for tall greater than uh, or equal to zero, we consider this function, which is um, three to the minus x tall, right? And then what we have is that the dimension of the diagonal with the set W tall is this one minus tall over one plus tall, where tall is between zero and one. Okay, the point is that actually it's it's really quite straightforward to see that if tor is, if we put tor bigger than one in this case, then actually all we get here for L intersect uh, the set W tor is just the origin. Okay, because this is the diagonal line. And remember here, what we're approximating by are rationals, right, um, where the rational points, where on one side it's of S over two to the N and then T over three to the N, right? So apart from the origin, there aren't any rational points of that form on the, on the actual diagonal, right? So the origin is always gonna be there, right? <clears throat> so all I'm saying here is that when tau is equal to zero, uh, tau is bigger than one, sorry, then the set is um, actually just the, the origin. Now, a funny thing here is, uh, I laugh because um, either, yeah, oh, anyway. so for, for tall big, for tall bigger than this one minus, so this, this I'm gonna start calling gamma, right, this log two over log three, um, we're not really able to prove the lower bound unless we use the, the ABC conjecture. 
So either uh, I'm being stupid um, and not able to see what one should be doing, and I'm, this is the thing that I want to really talk about, um, or I'm being stupid because I haven't seen that what we've got here, what we've got in front of us is something which is really very difficult. So anyway, it's a lose, it's a lose, lose situation, right? So, okay, so, so let me describe um, the main ideas, okay, about, about how you would go about proving these statements. And it's really about the distribution of these rational points and in this case, it's the distribution of rational points which are close to the diagonal. Okay. So, <clears throat> the oh, I should just say, of course, that so the result is actually true for a large class of um, uh, planar curves. Um, basically, uh, curves which are uh, locally uh, bilipsic in some sense, but. Dealing with the diagonal is really the key. Right, so trying to understand this set. Okay, so, so remember the, what, the picture that we had before. So, so the set is this uh, limb soup set of rectangles where the rectangles are centered at these rational points, and the side length is given by essentially epsilon over two to the n, and um, so this is the horizontal, uh, the long side of the rectangle, and this is the short side of the rectangle, right, epsilon um, three to the n. Um, so I'm going to assume that epsilon of n is less than half, this is not a big assumption, and um, so here we go. Um, so, so it just means that the rectangles, so the re in, in the grid that I drew before, so these rectangles in this union are actually disjoint. Okay. So it's clear, right, that we're only going to be interested in those rectangles here in this union, right, which actually intersect L, right, because what we're what we're interested in the end is L intersect this um, limb soup set, right? So if I have, uh, let me try this, yeah, blue, blue, nice, okay. So we have a, we've got the diagonal and we want our rectangles to intersect, right? So this is some rectangle at some point, um, <clears throat> at some rational point of this form. And what we're interested in then is this intersection here, right? For this um, limb soup set. And it's pretty easy to see that having, inter having this intersection puts a condition on the, on the closeness of the centers of the rectangles to the diagonal line L, right? So this was L. Okay, so what is this condition? Well, if we think of the, the worst case scenario and when it still intersects, so we have a rectangle like this, they should be the same size. Okay, so here's the center. Uh, okay. So what we have then is, so this is some point um, uh, S over um, two, to the, uh, two to the N, right? And this is, some point um, t over three to the n, right? So what it tells us then is that, so if we plot, if, so this is the, um, the y equals x line, right? So this is also down here on the x-axis, we've got the same point t over three to the n, right? So what it tells us is that the distance, <clears throat> that the distance from this horizontal distance right here, right, is um, no bigger than the sum of the long side plus the short side, 
I mean, half of it, right? Okay, so in other words, what we have is that we're going to have this rectangle intersecting um, the diagonal if and only if the distance between um, the coordinates in a sense is less than epsi of n over two to the n. So this is just the, um, the long side, right? The, the radius of the long side, if you want to put it that way. And this is the, the radius of the short side. Okay. So <clears throat> what that means then is that the set that we're interested in can be written as this um, limb soup of, so this is just the union over the rectangles in this in this set here, right, which um, intersect the diagonal. Okay, so and then we take L intersect R N. Right, so this was the maybe it's still there. So I hope that's clear what I'm trying what I'm trying to get at here. Right, so we're going to take so when he fixed N, right, we take the we take all the rectangles which intersect and we're just going to consider this um, this union of intervals of the intersections right so this is this is precisely what this is okay. right so where to go from here okay so now um, I'd like to get some sort of count right for this um, for this um, set of points for this collection of rectangles. So counting the number of rectangles which intersect the diagonal L is equivalent to counting the number of centers which satisfy this condition here, right? So clearly um, here, I can, this is less than or equal to two times this term here, because this dominates the, the one with the denominator three to the N. And so we can obtain an upper bound so <clears throat> for the number of rectangles by looking at this inequality here. So all I've done is we're multiplying through by um, two to the n times three to the n. So this becomes three to the n s minus two to the n t is less than or equal to three to the n psi of n. And I'm just bounding this by um, the same factor here, right? So what I get is this here. So this will be an upper bound. And throughout now, I'm just going to assume that S and T, they can't both be zero. Although, of course, in this, in this collection of rectangles, the origin is there, but let's just ignore that for the moment, okay? Um, it's just neat to think of it like this. And then, so do we want to count this? Well, this is actually quite easy to count because um, three to the N and two to the N are co-prime, right? So this, whoa, that was a big, that was a big slide, okay? so. So, so this is, um, so we can count this easily and get, uh, it's just the number of terms. So it's actually the integer part of this, um, the bound on the upper bound, right? So it's two times three to the n epsi of n. And for the lower bound, um, we look at pairs st. So this is going back to here where we'll, or well, this is this term here, if we just, uh, count those for which it's just less than or equal to epsi n over two to the n, this will certainly be a lower bound, right? So this is, <clears throat> again, the integer part of three to the n epsi of n. So I've, I've taken the integer part uh, consideration here by then. So I'll get this three to the n minus one, okay? But it really doesn't matter. Everything's gonna be up to a constant anyway. So. So all we're using here to, to count these terms here, right, is that three to the n and two to the n are co-prime. So there's these unique um, integers, S1 modulo two to the n, T1 modulo three to the n, satisfying this uh, linear congruence. Okay. And K, right, so, so we wanna then look at uh, solutions of this equal to K, Right, and what we have is that um, there's gonna be a unique integer pair, SK, TK, where SK is just 
k times s1 and modulo 2 to the n, and tk is just k times t1 modulo 3 to the n, right? And these satisfy uh, this congruence, and k right, is, is going to be less than 2 times 3 to the n epsilon here, which is less than 3 to the n. Okay, so this, all these solutions to this, um, to these, to these congruent, to this, um, um, <clears throat> uh, congruent, well, uh, linear equation, I guess, right? It's, it's, they're all going to be unique, right? Because we, where the, the upper bound is less than um, three to the n. Right. So what that means is that these, of course, the so S K and T K are just the centers of our um, rectangles. Okay. Well, S K over two to the n and uh, T K over three to the n are the centers of the rectangles associated with <coughs> um, the set R n epsilon of n. Okay, so I've just summarized here um, what we've just found that, um, that we've got upper and lower bounds. So this is, I mean, you can obviously do much better than this, but this is good enough for us that, which basically tells us that the number of rectangles <coughs> that intersect the diagonal is um, three to the n epsi of n, okay, up to constants. And, the point is that this um, upper bound is enough um, to prove um, the uh, uh, measure statement and the upper bound dimension part of, of um, both theorems. Okay, so this is the easy, these are the easy parts of, of, the, um, of the theorems. Um, and also, this was the comment that I made earlier, that if we look at the special function, you know, which was, of, um, so was, it's three to the minus n tor, right, then uh, what we get here is that if tor is bigger than one, then this count here is actually less than one, so it's actually zero, okay, but we took out, if you remember, the origin, right? But the origin's always there. So, so what we get in this case is that the, the set L intersect with the, um, <clears throat> the tall well approximal point, this W tall is actually just the origin, right? So it's not particularly interesting. Right, so what about the other parts? Right, so <clears throat> maybe I should just say, I don't have time. Do you know, so how long, do, do I have 50 minutes, 50? You have 50 minutes, yes, sure. sure. Yes, please go ahead. Oh. Another 50 minutes. As long as you need. So um, then 15, uh, whatever you need. <laughs> no, 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 I'm joking. All right, so look, um, so, you know, um what I want to do, if, if, if I want, let me just say one thing here. So this convergent measure part, right? Well, it, it really is just coming from this count because remember what we said was that we had, we got, we got the diagonal line, right? And we've got these, the precisely the rectangles. So we're counting rectangles which intersect, right? And what we have, uh, we're, we're then measuring, whoa, we're then measuring this intersection here. Well, this intersection is, is roughly, well, um, actually, uh, we can assume that all of our rectangles actually intersect uh, properly in this way. And so in other words, none of them are doing this. Okay, so but anyway, an upper bound is going to be at least um, two times uh, this this shorter length here, right? So two times epsi um, of n 
over three to the n, all right? So that's for one of these rectangles. Well, how many of them are there? Well, it's bounded above by this three to the n epsi of n, right? So what do we get is that the measure then of the, for a fixed n, that of the, rec of the rectangles intersecting the line is bounded above by this epsi of n squared, right? And again, we just use borel Contelli. So if this sum converges, then the set of points which lie in infinitely many of these um, uh, intervals on the diagonal is of measure zero, right? So that's actually how you prove the convergent part. And the, di and, and the convergent and the sort of upper bound for the dimension is, is pretty similar, but instead of using um, <clears throat> um, the Lebesgue volume sum here, you, 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 you take the diameter here of the and raise it to some power s. Okay, so that's, and then you'd ask for a convergence. So another question, uh, who's this? Sam, can you please um, go ahead and ask your question? By Sam. Oh, hey, Sam. Hello, Sam. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Very well. Uh, yeah, enjoying your talk. So my question is just: Can can you replace two to the n and three to the n by pretty arbitrary functions for the convergence theory? Because uh, it doesn't seem like you use the fact that they're two to the n and three to the n yet. No, so yeah, so here, uh, basically, lack lacking sequences will do. Okay. Um, all right. Right. Um, but see, th there's a problem. So on the number theory side, it's fine, right? But it doesn't then match necessarily with the um, with the matrix problem. Sure. Um, that's that's okay, right? I guess this um, problem you could you yeah. could. Um, Ignore matrices and just try to say that you're approximating, um, yeah, you're approximating x by fractions with denominator two to the n and three to the n at the same time. And sure. Consider arbitrary functions here uh, or lacunary functions. Yes, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you could, of course you can do that. But see, we start, the point was that we started off with the um, with the matrix problem, um, right? Which is which? No, but this is fine, right? I mean, so when we're writing this stuff up, we're going to do it in the two different problems in some ways, right? But um, we we don't know how to, well, we haven't really thought about it very much yet, uh, what it, how to go about trying to do this in the, in the matrix case. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so the point is, you know, like, because these are integers, then p to the n of, of x, I mean, two to the n of x is the, you know, taking the fractional part is the same as, you know, looking at two times x fractional part, and multiplying it by two, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I, I can see how, why why these come from the matrix problem. Um, yeah, I was just wondering about something more general because it seems like you do actually get something much more general here. Like maybe you need some like an condition, but it, it it yeah, it seems like you sure. get something much more general yeah. than the matrix problem at least on the convergence side. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Great. Okay. Thanks. Under lacunary, it is fine either. Uh, the growth should be about the growth of smooth functions uh, of smooth numbers. Okay, um, so for the, ooh, it's, oh God, every time I, okay, so for the lower, for the lower bound, the count's not enough. And so those who, you know, worked in the, in this area know that you also need, so you need the optimal count, but you also need something about the distribution of the, of the actual, okay, so we actually need to have some good information about the distribution of the, the centers of the of the rectangle. So remember, what we've shown is that these these are of the form s k over two to the n t k over two to the n, where s k is just remember s one t one. This is just the solution to the linear congruence. Um, I have such bad memory. So this is um, where is it? Um, two to the n, three to the n. S minus uh, two to the n t equals one. Ah. <laughs> okay, so this this so S one T one satisfies this, and then 
the SKs and TKs are just K times these um, reduced modulo 2 to the n and 3 to the n respectively. Okay, and because we're not going any further than 3 to the n, um, <coughs> these points are unique. Okay, so, so let me now explain um, what sort of information um, we have, or rather we don't have. So let me just, um, so let me call, so let me just go back here. Let me call this, um, <clears throat> so this is the number of uh, rectangles we have, right? It's three to the n epsi of n. So this I'm just gonna call delta n. Okay, so we're gonna split this so the distribution of these centers really depends on whether that we have um, at least two to the end points or less than two to the end points. Okay, so what happens, of course, is that if we have um, more than two to the end points, then all the denominator, all the rationals here Right? So if k is bigger than, if we're running k up to something which is bigger than two to the n, then all the denominators with rationals with um, of two to the n, uh, numerators rather, the fractions with denominator two to the n will actually occur right, um, as points on the centers in the rectangles. Right? So this is case one. So this is actually the easy case. Right? So when Delta n, the number of points is bigger than two to the n. Okay, so <clears throat> what what's happening there? Then in this case, is I will be finishing on time. I hope um, is that we've got our diagonal line, right? We've got we've got our um, so along the x-axis here, right, whoops. Right, what we've got is our rationals with denominator um, two to the n, right? And what we get is that for each of these uh, rationals with denominator two to the n, so if this is, let me draw this one here. So this is, um, so let's call it, so this is uh, s over two to the n. Right, what we're going to get is some rectangle up here, which will intersect it. Okay. And then, because, so this is the same, this condition here is the same as saying one over three to the n is less than epsi n over two to the n, right? So not only do all these rationals um, with denominator to the n, we will get another rational here, right? So if we were to draw a square around this, Right. Then in this direction, remember in the vertical direction, the rationals are separated by one over three to the n. Right. And this separation, this vertical separation here, right, is less than the side length, the long side length of the rectangles. Right. So we're actually going to get these guys turning up as well. Right. So for any, for, for, so for each S, right, that, that, for each S, right, we're gonna end up with how many um, rectangles here? Well, it's gonna be the side length, which is essentially epsi n over two to the n, right, time divided by the separation of rationals vertically, which is one over three, divided by the separation, which is one over three to the n, so this is three to the n times that, right? Okay, so we have this really quite, it's good enough picture that at every uh, point, um, at every rational with denominator two to the n, we get this sort of blocks, right? Um, where we have a good understanding of the distribution of the, of the points, okay? But this is true then for every rational uh, with denominator two to the n, that's the point, okay? So 
when this doesn't happen, so when epsi of n is, when this, sorry, delta n is less than two to the n, then not all rational points turn up with denominator two to the n, and we need to know something about their distribution. And that's where things get a bit, oh, it, it seems so elementary, but I, it, oh, it's quite frustrating. Okay, so, okay, so, so this is the, the case, the, diff, the, the case that we really deal with, um, apart from using a sledgehammer, it seems, um, that when this delta n is less than two to the n, then not all the rationals turn up. And what we need is to understand the distribution of the rationals that do turn up, right? So remember that these rationals are just, um, what we're doing, we've got our S1 over two to the N, right? Um, and then we're just multiplying this and reducing modulo one, right? And we're, and we're going up to this delta of N. Okay, so time, time, time. Okay, so what we need um, is some information. So this is to prove the dimension result. Uh, what we need is that um, these rational points that we actually get that turn up here in, in, this, in this collection here, right, is that if we put um, an interval around them of size, so this is just one over the cardinality, but give yourself a little bit of space, this epsilon, right, and this um, should cover the unit interval. Okay. Um, so actually, we don't need such uh, a strong statement, but this is what the is us, right? But so what we could actually get away with. So remember, of course, this is for a particular n, right? So this s1 and sk, they really actually depend on this. I should really put here that this s1 depends on n, sk depends on n, right? Uh, so this is a statement. Right, really, um, uh, oh, internet, okay, so this is a statement which depends on n, and what we really want is um, that the measure of the balls centered around these uh, rational points of data two to the n of this size, um, they cover the unit interval, okay, and, and for infinitely many n. Okay, so we don't need this for all n. Okay, so, so a little, uh, something about the proof then of, of what's going on here. So what we've got is we've got delta n points, right, distinct points in the unit intervals. Now by the three gaps theorem, we know that there are <laughs> three gaps right, uh, G1, G2, and G3, where the largest gap, G3, is just the sum of G1 and G2, okay? So, of course, if G1, the smallest gap, and G2 are roughly of the same size, right, then we'd have a, then we're, we're in good shape, right, because then we'd have a good distribution of these, um, of these, of these rational points, right? And so up to, so in that case, up to a constant, um, so if the, then all the gaps were the same, so up to constant, what we'd be able to do is actually prove this statement here, uh, it's one, right, with epsilon equal to zero, but we might have to uh, put some, some constants in here, right? But who cares, okay? So what we're able to do, and uh, this is really, actually, I should, this is really, actually Evgeny who uh, figured this out was that um, if you assume the ABC, then you can prove that the minimum gap, right, to the power one minus epsilon is bigger than um, G2. Okay, so with that information, then um, that establishes um, this, this, uh, this statement one. Okay, so I think I should, 
but one last thing then let me just say that in this this condition um this delta n being less than two to the n right in the case of this function epsi of tor um being um uh, three to the minus n tor right um gives you precisely the statement that tor is bigger than one minus gamma which is the condition um in the theorem that i stated right in the house dimensions um theorem okay i think i should probably let me see what i've got i don't even remember what i've got here ah okay so planar so we could do planar curves but okay let's just let's call it a day here that's fine 